Hey everyone, welcome back to The Week in Charts, where I run through the most important charts and themes in markets and investing. Big show for you this week, a lot to talk about. Let's start out by talking about earnings and really a trend that's come to a screeching halt after a decade plus run. So the big four companies in the US, these are the four largest companies by market cap, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon. If we look at a chart of their revenues over time, just unbelievable growth. And in particular, over the last 10 years, tremendous increases. So 10 years ago, if we look at the combined revenue of these four companies, 345 billion. Fast forward to today, 1.39 trillion. So just remarkable, remarkable growth rates. That 1.39 trillion number is actually higher than the GDP of all but 15 countries. So four companies bigger than uh, the economies of most countries in the world. So unbelievable stat. You have this tremendous tailwind for the markets uh, in terms of the growth rates of these companies driving the S&P 500 higher, driving the share prices of these companies higher as well. All of them did much better than the S&P over the last decade, but that was the past. What is going on today? Very different story. So if we look at revenue growth in Q4, without exception we're seeing a slowdown so tesla still pretty high at 37 percent year over year but even for tesla that was the slowest growth rate we've seen since 2020 and the rest of them kind of historic numbers here in terms of growth rates some of them like netflix slowest in company history and others among the slowest that we've ever seen uh, and we've seen outright declines for facebook and apple in terms of year over year revenue growth the net income picture, even worse. Uh, again, Tesla being the outlier here, up 60% year over year. All of these other companies reporting a year over year decline in their net income. Amazon and Netflix down over 90% from the prior year. So big, big shift uh, in terms of revenue and net income for the leading companies in the US. And if we dig in and look at the bellwether stock, so that would be Apple, largest company by market cap, big driver of investor sentiment. And Apple, perhaps more than any other company, benefited from the three rounds of stimulus where we essentially sent out free money to people. Some of that money was saved uh, and some of it was spent. And the money that was spent, a good portion of it is going to discretionary things like new iPhones, new iPads, new Apple Watches. Uh, and we just saw this tremendous revenue growth increase for Apple over 50% year over year. But that's really starting to wear off now. If we see Apple's trajectory since then, every single quarter pretty much coming down. And now we're actually seeing a negative year over year growth rate for Apple. That's the largest negative number we've seen since 2016. So many different uh, segments in terms of Apple seeing a slowdown in growth. But the iPhone still the biggest driver for Apple. And there we saw an 8% decline in revenue. So very different picture for Apple from where we were a year ago or two years ago. Uh, if we shift gears, talk about Google. Uh, Google, 1% revenue growth number, just really not what the company typically does. We've seen just years and years of tremendous growth. Pandemic here really had an uh, impact on the chart here slight negative number for the early stages when they thought there was going to be a recession advertisers pulled back but then just a real boom for google like many other big tech companies google's benefiting from that stay at home economy people using products more using obviously youtube more during that period of time and now we've seen a reversion to the mean one percent year over year growth that's the third slowest in the company's history amazon Amazon probably in the last 20 years, no company has had a, of its size, has had a revenue growth uh, acceleration that, that Amazon has on a consistent, consistent basis. So Amazon pretty much every year before uh, recent years has done double digit revenue growth, just unbelievable uh, in terms of its consistency. Uh, and the recent number 8.6% stands out because it's only the fourth sub 10 percent numbers and all of the other three were in recent quarters so coming off of uh, the increases in the early stages of the pandemic again stimulus driven people using amazon more can't go to the store you're buying more online amazon benefiting from that trend uh, and now we're seeing the opposite end of that the reversion to the mean 
Uh, so very different quarter for Amazon. If we look at profitability, just a stunning, stunning reversal. Amazon goes from record profitability uh, following the uh, pandemic period. And then we have its largest annual loss ever, 2.7 billion last year. So 180 degree reversal for Amazon. And if we look at S&P 500 overall in terms of revenue growth on a nominal basis, still positive, but again, during this inflation period, I think you have to always adjust for higher inflation. And there we're seeing a slight decline if we adjust for inflation in Q4. So different picture there. The concern will be this, this is going to get worse as it tends to do during recession. So if we see 2020, 2008 and 2001 recessions, we saw much lower real sales growth for the S&P 500. So question is, will that happen? If it does, obviously going to be a headwind for the market. And if we look at overall company earnings, now we have 79% of companies reported. So the majority of companies are already reported earnings. And we can see here that Apple, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft are not the exceptions. We're seeing 23% decline overall year over year in terms of uh, earnings growth. So a uh, difficult picture for the S&P 500 earnings. The expectations are what drive everything. And I think right now the investors are expecting that this worst is kind of over and we're going to see uh, earnings recover in the coming quarters. That doesn't happen. That's going to be a problem for markets given sentiment. And we'll talk about sentiment in a little bit. So lastly, I want to talk about profit margins. And this is an important point uh, because during uh, the initial stages of the stimulus, companies really benefited from that surge in sales and you didn't have a jump in inflation right away. It came with a lag. So you actually had rep record profit margins here in 2021. Just unbelievable. I don't think anyone would have predicted that. That record profit margin, now you're seeing a slight uh, step towards a reversion to the mean. So 11.2% in terms of, of operating profit margins. A year ago, that was 13.4%. So what's going on there? We have, of course, a slowdown in terms of revenue growth, but you also have companies uh, seeing uh, their costs go up. So inflation having a negative impact and they're having a harder time passing on those costs to the end customer, to the end consumer. So they're taking a hit to their margins, to their profitability. And so the question is, does this continue to mean revert? And we've had a long period with the exception of that, that brief dip during the COVID uh, early stages of COVID. Uh, we've had above average profit margins for a long time. Big driver of that is, is the increase in importance of tech in the U.S. Uh, but the question always remains, is competition going to drive that lower? Perhaps inflation is going to drive that lower. And if we're going to talk about 8.5% profit margins versus the current 11%, well, that's a very different picture in terms of what investors will likely value these companies are at. So this is something we're going to watch closely this year. So let's talk about uh, the jobs market, really huge, huge jobs number, over 500,000 jobs created in the most recent report, blowing out uh, estimates, which were under 200,000. Uh, I think that surprised a lot of people given the headline news. The headline news is all talking about layoffs, particularly at all of the major tech companies, pretty sizable layoffs. And I think this was a good chart kind of explaining what's going on here from the Wall Street Journal, looking at that tech sector, so the information technology sector, we're seeing a slight declines in terms of, of jobs there. But if we look at overall, we're seeing it positive and that's driven by gains in other areas of the economy outpacing the losses in tech companies for now. So if we look at things like leisure and hospitality, travel industry still booming, and a lot of these areas of the economy outside of tech didn't overhire. They are still short of workers. So they lost all of these workers during the pandemic and they've been trying to lower them back, but they still, there still remains a gap between what these companies need uh, and what's out there. So it, what we're seeing is interesting divergence here where in the technology sector, you're seeing pretty broad based layoffs, but the rest of the economy we're seeing still job gains. And so if we look at the consecutive months of job games, now we're at 25. Uh, so 
over two years of every single month, we've seen job growth. And if we look at the unemployment rate, it actually ticked down uh, to 3.4%. So what's notable about that? Well, we haven't seen an unemployment rate that low since 1969. So really incredible, again, remarkable, given what happened uh, during the month or two after the pandemic started, we saw unemployment jump to 14.7%. Uh, then it starts to come down pretty much month after month, but I'm not sure anyone would have predicted that we'd actually go below pre-pandemic levels, lowest since 1969. And so what's driving this strength? Again, I think it's the, uh, the mismatch between supply and demand, and still many companies, tech excluded, are are in a shortage of workers. They're still trying to get people to come back to the labor force. And I think this uh, chart here tells an important story. So what I did is I took the uh, number before COVID, the total US non-farm payrolls, 152 million. And I said, what was the kind of the trend over the last five years before uh, February, 2020? It was about 1.5% percent growth a year in terms of of jobs uh, in the US. And if you look at that and project it over time to today, well, we would have had 159 million, let's say if we didn't have the pandemic and the recession associated with that. And where are we today? Well, we see, we've seen an unbelievable recovery, uh, you know, losing all of these jobs in a few months in 2020, and then just gradually gaining them back month after month. But at 155 million, that's still a gap from what the pre-COVID trend uh, is. So we're looking at a 4 million uh, differential in terms of uh, what it would have been versus what it is today. And I think that's driving this gap between the number of job openings and the number of unemployed. So there's still over 5 million spread. So you have 5 million more job openings than you have unemployed people. So as long as that persists, and as long as the people that are unemployed want to come back to the labor force, and we talked about reasons why they're more likely to come back now, stimulus payments wearing off, uh, inflation becoming more of an issue. So people need to work just to keep uh, pace with inflation. Uh, and perhaps that's uh, explaining that large uh, jobs jump over 500,000 last month. So we'll see. You never want to put too much weight on any one month. Uh, because there's a lot of, of error if we look at the jobs report and a lot of revisions over time. Uh, but this kind of, if this persists, you would suspect that we're going to see more job gains before, uh, you know, before that kind of balance between a supply and demand uh, uh, changes. So we still have just really a shortage of workers in many industries and absent a recession where consumers are really pulling back. Uh, if you're just going to see that trend uh, continue. And the question is, will that continue to outweigh the job losses that we've seen in the tech sector? And if we talk about job losses, I think there's a, a, a notion going around in the media uh, that's pretty interesting. They're saying uh, in many areas that the Fed wants you to lose your job. The Fed is not happy with that employment report. They're not happy with unemployment rate going down. They're not happy with jobs. Uh, going up and new jobs being added. Uh, and we're just seeing all these headlines. The Fed is trying to slow jobs growth. They're, they want you to lose your job. They're trying to push unemployment higher. Uh, and I think this notion is absolutely wrong. It's absurd. Uh, it's false. Uh, and uh, for a few reasons. And uh, if we talk about the drivers of inflation, uh, and what actually drove inflation higher here to 40 year highs, uh, the jobs picture had nothing to do with that. So let's talk about the two big factors here uh, that no one, seem, want, no one seems to want to talk about. Number one being the money supply. So we increased the money supply by over 40% in two years. So if we combine 2020, 2021, we decide to increase the money supply 40%. Obviously that's having a massive impact on inflation. And then we add massive deficits. So we increased national debt by over six trillion in two years, uh, and we sent that money out to people. Uh, and of course, now we have too much money chasing too few goods. So those are the two primary factors driving inflation higher. It certainly wasn't uh, jobs growth 
uh, causing that. These are the two big factors. And really to illustrate that, if we look at the longest period of jobs growth in US history, 113 consecutive months, that's coming after the financial crisis. If we look at what the inflation rate was during that period of time, the average less than 2% per year if we're looking at CPI. So if, if, the, if jobs growth was bad in terms of uh, it, you know, inflation, it, that it, it, more jobs meant higher inflation, uh, then certainly we would have seen it during this period of record jobs growth. So I think what they're doing is kind of confusing th two things here. The Fed wants lower inflation, and that's why they're hiking interest rates. And as a consequence of that, we could eventually see a slowdown in the economy, which could lead to jobs losses, job losses. But that doesn't mean that the Fed wants to see those job losses or even needs to see it for the inflation rate to come down. And we're already seeing that, right? So inflation rate peaks uh, last June at 9.1%. We're down to 6.5% now. It's likely to show another decline when they report this week, the new inflation number for January. And we've come down from 9.1% down to 6.5% with continued job gains. So the Fed's getting what they want without uh, unemployment going higher. I don't think that they need to see jobs uh, uh, job losses. I don't think they need to see higher employment. They just need to see inflation continue to come down. So ironically, one of the ways inflation might come down is if people re-enter the labor force, the supply chain issues uh, get better. Uh, and so you have more of a, a supply of labor. Well, that will also lower uh, wage growth in the future. That's a driver of inflation as well. So I think uh, people are getting this wrong and thinking that the Fed and Jerome Powell want to see a, a, a bad uh, employment report. Not at all. The Fed wants to see lower inflation. And if they can get there without jobs, job losses, and there's all the evidence points to the fact that they can, because the two main drivers of inflation uh, during this period were increase in money supply and increase in national debt. So if we just slow that and we maintain the discipline there, we're going to likely see lower inflation rate. And we're already seeing that, right? So we've now reduced the money supply in 2022. Now we're seeing the opposite impact of that with lower inflation rates. Deficit's still pretty high, but obviously much lower than it was. So if we hold the line there, we don't announce new major spending or stimulus bills. I suspect inflation rate's going to continue to come down uh, and it, it can do so without job losses. So about the Fed, uh, many people are still asking, why Why are they hiking rates again? Why, why aren't they done hiking? And again, I'm going to point to this picture here. This is what the Fed is looking at, the gap between inflation and hourly earnings. Still a gap, and they want to see this gap close. So we have hourly earnings, 4.4% increase. So that's been coming down. Inflation obviously coming down as well, 6.5% likely to come down again this week when they report the new number, uh, but there's still a gap there. And when there's a gap, that means prosperity is going down. That means your purchasing power is going down and the Fed wants to see this closed. So I think within the next month or, month or two, you're going to see that inflation rate continue to come down and you're going to get closer to that hourly earnings number. It's going to give the Fed a lot more comfort in saying, let's pause here. Perhaps uh, we're done uh, for the cycle as long as that inflation rate stays down. So let's take a look at what the Fed uh, has done here so far. Hike rates from zero all the way up in February, the hike to four and a half to 4.75%. And the expectation is that we have a few more to go. So I put out a poll asking what people are thinking. How much higher uh, will that Fed funds rate go during the current cycle? And the majority of people, so 41% saying uh, the biggest response was saying two more hikes. But if we combine that with the one more hike camp and no more hike camp, 78% uh, of people, so the vast majority of people saying the Fed is almost done. So only 22% saying there's going to be uh, 75 basis points or more increase in the Fed funds rate from here. And if we look at market expectations, they're kind of in line with what people are thinking here as of today. So we're looking at expectations of 25 basis point hike in March when the Fed meets 
and then another 25 basis points in May, and then a pause. So a little bit of a shift there after the employment report, the market had been expecting just one more hike, maybe two, and now they're kind of in the camp of we're going to have two more and then a pause. So this could change. I think one more is definitely in the cards for March, given the high probability the market's assigning to it. Over 90% chance right now the Fed's going to hike at least one more time when it meets in March. And then from there, it's going to depend on really the inflation trajectory. So if we get just a stunningly low inflation number, we're going to have the uh, a few more inflation reports before that May number. Perhaps that'll be enough for the Fed to say, let's pause here and, and reassess and see what happens. So it's going to be path dependent, but you're going to get at least one more. And the Fed really wants to close that gap between the inflation rate and wages. And uh, I think they'll get there. Uh, the question is, this: uh, when are they going to get there this year? And do they want to see it actually cross over before they stop? Or can they stop on the assumption that it will cross over soon? So what are these expectations doing in terms of treasury yields? Well, as you might expect, they're pushing them higher. So one-year treasury yield uh, is now 4.85%. That's the highest since August 2007. And three-month bill, 4.77%, also highest since August 2007. So savers, again, benefiting from this. If you have money in a zero interest checking account, you can go out there and get pretty much 4.5% in high yield uh, savings account risk-free, right? FDIC insured up to 250,000 uh, per individual. And so just a huge difference from where we were a year ago. Just a year ago, the Fed still hadn't hiked rates yet off of zero. You're earning essentially nothing. Uh, on your cash, and now you can earn four and a half percent. And if the Fed hikes two more times, you're going to be able to earn five percent risk-free uh, in terms of uh, Treasury bills, money market funds, and money market accounts. So, unbelievable shift in just a one-year period of time. But if we're looking at longer term, if we're looking at where that one-month yield is going to trend, well, that's going to be dependent on expectations about future uh, Fed policy. And if this is correct if the market's correct that the fed's going to start cutting rates here at the end of this year and uh, continue to cut in 2024 well then you're going to see obviously one year yields by the end of this year start to move lower again longer term yields as well so this is all subject to change but as of now very good news for savers you haven't had yields this high uh, in terms of cash uh, for since since 2007 so really remarkable um what about the, while savers are, are definitely feeling much better, how is the average person feeling today versus a year ago? So you're earning a lot more on your savings, but the inflation picture has been the biggest issue for people. If you look at poll after poll, you're seeing it's front and center still on people's minds. And this Gallup poll uh, really tells the story here. 50% of people said they were worse off than a year ago in this poll. And that's pretty rare if you go back. Historically, you don't often see it at 50% or higher. In fact, we've only seen it twice uh, at 50% or higher, and that was in 2008 and 2009. So during a recession, financial crisis, 50% plus decline in the S&P 500, people were feeling worse uh, than they were a year before. They're also saying that today, and the big driver, of course, is that inflation picture. So if inflation gets better, you'd expect uh, more people to feel positive. So the breakdown here is very important because if you listen to the Fed in 2020, they were actually telling a story saying that if inflation were to come, and it was starting to show signs of rising in early 2021, if it were to come, it would actually be good for people with lower incomes. And so very interesting that they would say that because all of the evidence uh, historically has been the contrary uh, where lower people with lower incomes are hit much harder uh, with periods of high inflation because they spend a higher percentage of their income on essentials so on food gasoline if you have an income that's lower and those things go up you can't stop spending on those things shelter as well uh, rents going up home prices going up and so those people are feeling it by far the most and i think this poll really bears that out. If you look at the percentage of people saying they're worse off, lower income, much higher percentage of people saying that than higher income. So 
we could put that, I think, to rest here. The notion that inflation is good for people with lower incomes, absolutely false. It's the worst for them. People with higher incomes have more assets. Assets tend to go up uh, with higher inflation over time. So that benefits them. And simply their incomes are higher. So if the uh, price of gas is going up or food's going up as a percentage of their income, it's not as big of a factor. But how are people thinking? How are Americans thinking about the future? This is always fascinating to me. Americans are an optimistic bunch. So even though they're feeling pretty bad now, as has often been the case, they're thinking they'll be better a year from now. Hopefully that's correct. 60% of people in this poll saying they're going to be better off a year from now to, than today. And I think a big driver of that is people thinking that inflation is going to be under control at that point. And so hopefully that's the case. Hopefully this poll is correct and everyone's better off a year from now than today. Let's talk about how a lot can change in a decade. We saw that earlier with the big four in terms of the revenues, unbelievable growth. But I think if you look at Tesla versus other auto manufacturers, really, it's just an unbelievable story, a big difference in just a 10 year period. 10 years ago, Tesla's revenues less than a billion. Today, they're at 80 billion. If you look at Ford and GM, essentially flat in terms of revenues over the last decade, while Tesla is growing astronomically. And if we look at net income, the picture is even bigger in terms of the difference. Tesla had a negative net income 10 years ago, and today a higher profit than both Ford and GM at 12.6 billion. So tremendous thing. Uh, I've tweeted this out and uh, Elon Musk actually responded to the tweet saying how have how times have changed. So very interesting uh, picture here. And obviously the expectation from markets, if we're looking at how Tesla is valued uh, today and uh, compared to Ford and GM, much higher valuation multiple. The expectation is this gap in terms of revenue is going to continue to close uh, in, in the coming year. So the expectation is Tesla is going to continue to take share from both Ford and GM and other manufacturers. And obviously EVs are going to become a bigger, uh, bigger part, much bigger part of the auto market, but just unbelievable in a 10 year period. Very few companies have seen the revenue growth that Tesla has. So let's talk about buybacks. And when we talk about buybacks, nobody is bigger than Apple. Apple's been absolutely the buyback king. Uh, and if we look at the last 10 years, 566 billion in buybacks over the last 10 years. That's greater than the market cap of 494 companies in the S&P 500. Just an unbelievable amount of buybacks. Obviously, shareholders love that. Uh, and we've seen uh, Apple's uh, share price go up uh, enormously in the last decade. So they're very happy returning money uh, to shareholders, shareholders rewarding Apple with much higher stock price. And if we talk about buybacks and policy shifts, uh, obviously in that Inflation Reduction Act, they snuck in a 1% tax on buybacks. So it kind of became this rallying cry that it, buybacks are bad and uh, that company should be punished for that. And uh, somehow I guess that was going to help reduce uh, inflation. So they slapped this 1% tax on buybacks. Didn't seem to have any effect. So 1% apparently not enough uh, we saw. Uh, huge buybacks last year across the board no meaningful change from the prior year i think it, in fact there was there was a substantial increase if we look at the uh, percentage change from 2022 versus 2021 in terms of buybacks for most companies so one percent nine not enough if you listen to the state of the union president biden uh, suggested we should go even higher with that so he wanted to quadruple the uh, buyback tax to 4%. Um, so whatever you think of that, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, you just have Republicans in, in charge of, of the House now, and they're not going to approve anything, any increase in terms of, of taxes, I don't think, and certainly not a quadrupling of that buyback tax. So uh, interesting thing there. Now let's shift gears, talk about the markets and sentiment for me has been people ask me why is the market going up more than anything else it's sentiment driven in the short term and simply a shift in sentiment and and if people become more optimistic and they were pessimistic well that's that's fuel to drive the market higher and that's exactly what we've seen over the past few months in terms of the market's rally 
you just had this very, very bearish sentiment for persisting for a long period of time. And really late September, early October, with S&P 500 near its low, you had extreme negative sentiment uh, in number of polls, AAII sentiment poll being one of them. And what I talked about for most of uh, the fourth quarter last year is you had this persistent negativity. So 44 consecutive weeks we actually had where bears in this poll outnumbered bulls. So we had never seen that before with data going back to 1987. So just negative, a negative reading after negative reading that actually flipped to positive uh, in, in the most recent data point uh, for the first time in a long time. So uh, what was once a tailwind for the market, I wouldn't say it's a headwind yet, but no longer a tailwind. Now you have people starting to sign on to that bullish camp, more optimistic about stocks going forward. So if we talk about sentiment, what I always say about sentiment, it's only important at the extremes. If you're in the middle here, it's telling you nothing. So we're now back in the middle, not telling you anything about the future direction of the markets. But when you're at this negative extreme, what you tend to see uh, is above average stock market returns going forward. So now we're out of that area uh, and we don't have sentiment as, let's say, a catalyst to go higher. It doesn't mean stocks can't go higher, but sentiment driving that probably won't be one of the reasons uh, that stocks move higher from here. If we look at the uh, name exposure index, so this is polling active managers ask, asking them, what's your exposure to the equity market? Uh, and as you can see here, last year it hit the lowest level since March 2020. So extreme negativity because active managers were sold out. They had very low exposure to the market. And lo and behold, the market rallies. And these active managers now have increased their exposure at higher prices. So now the exposure of these active managers are averaging about 85%. That's the highest we've seen since January 2022. So sentiment shift kind of across the board. What's driving that? What always drives sentiment is price. And we see now a 20% rally off the October lows. That's the biggest rally we've seen since the market peaked in January, 2022. So we have this uh, decline, 27.5% peak to trough, uh, the bottom here, October 13 of last year and market rallies 20%. People are very, very negative on the stock market over here, extreme negative sentiment. Market rallies 20%, higher prices, people are more bullish. So it's really counterintuitive. Uh, you, you hear a saying all the time, buy low, sell high. Well, on average, most people do the opposite. They want to buy higher after the news is better uh, and they tend to be a seller at lower prices. So counterintuitive, uh, but that people in markets are, are psychology driven. They're driven by fear and greed. And over here, Fear is driving everything. And here, I wouldn't say they're greedy, uh, but they're mu there's much less fear, obviously, than down here. And they're starting to think about perhaps, perhaps you know, maybe that was the low. So every couple of weeks I do a poll, I'll do it again to see where sentiment stands. But asking people, was this the low for the bear market? And around here, very few people thought it was the low. Um, and now more and more people in the, in that poll that I've been doing, have been saying perhaps this was the low. So sentiment drives price wherever the S and P goes next, that's going to drive uh, sentiment. If we see a move back down, feels like they see the bears come back. If we continue to run, I suspect you're going to see more bulls. Let's talk about Disney and their number one priority today. And that would be cutting costs, increasing profitability. And this really tells the story. Revenues hit a record high last year, 84 billion. But if we look at net income, uh, not recovering in the same fashion. So we had, obviously, Disney took a hit uh, during the pandemic, less people going to the parks. That has come roaring back. And profitability, though, has remained down. If we look at their profit margins, uh, we're talking about a huge difference from where they were, not just before the pandemic, but if we look at, let's say, the last decade, 3.9% profit margin, much lower than the average over the last decade, last two decades. And so what does Disney announce that they're doing? Bob Iger uh, has said they're going to slash jobs. They're going to cut costs. And they're also bringing back 
uh, their dividend later this year. So uh, shareholder friendly changes. Stock initially jumped on on the news of this, then it came back down. So we'll see what happens from there. But this is really a broader trend that we're seeing across the landscape here where companies during uh, 2021, it didn't matter really what was going on uh, in terms of the bottom line. It was all about revenues and all about growth and revenues. And now much different market, people are really paying attention to those profit mar margins and profitability numbers, net income numbers. And they're really punishing companies that are failing to show uh, uh, improved profit margins and failing to show positive uh, net income. So very different environment than where we were in 2021, at the peak of the mania, all that mattered was driving that top line number uh, higher. And today it's all about that bottom line with companies trying to get there, trying to get to a better bottom line by cutting costs. So many of these companies hired, uh, hired, over hired, hired too many employees. They didn't, they were expecting huge growth rates to continue. Uh, that didn't happen. And we're seeing really a right sizing of many uh, technology companies. If you look at the share prices, things like Facebook, uh, many examples, Netflix, of these companies that have cut costs, uh, and you're seeing the share prices start to move in the opposite direction. So investors, in the long run, companies are valued based on long term stream of earnings, not revenues. And so uh, these cost cuts, if they can improve profitability, uh, investors are liking that and and rewarding companies that are doing that and and doing that in a fashion that will help uh, long term profitability. So this is a fun one. Uh, the crop report was bad. If we look at frozen concentrate orange juice, you might not know that they have a futures contract for this. But if you watch the movie uh, Trading Places. Uh, you're probably familiar with that famous scene uh, where Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd are down in the trading pit uh, and they have the inside information that the crop report was going to be good and that was going to send uh, orange juice prices down. This we're seeing the opposite scenario here where uh, Florida's orange crop has just been decimated over the last year. Hurricane damage, you have this citrus greening disease uh, and so oranges in short supply and similar that we talked about in terms of eggs uh, in the last video, we're just seeing that supply demand imbalance lead to a spike in prices. Uh, this was kind of crazy. Uh, I saw this, that the average price of a gallon of orange juice is up to 878 a gallon. Uh, it's, that's just unbelievable to me that, that it's that high. Now, orange juice to me is not like eggs. I think this is going to obviously impact demand it probably already is you can substitute orange juice for other juices or just drink water obviously instead we, i think most studies now show that juice is not very good for you given the sugar content uh but uh what i suspect is what we'll see is going to be similar to what we're, we're going to see uh, in the eggs egg prices which is this is going to be uh, rebalanced here from a combination of lower demand and supply coming back uh, but just another example of supply and demand in markets uh, working their way out. And the cure for high prices, as the saying goes, is high prices. So having this price this high, if there's a substitute, people will substitute it, su do make that substitution, and the price eventually will come down. And again, that supply is going to be replenished at some point. So if we talk about inflation relief, most things are not going the way of orange juice, thankfully. They're going in a much better direction. And so I want to end with this positive note where we're seeing just these more and more signs of things moving in the right direction. We look at used car prices, again, was a big leading driver of, uh, important leading driver of inflation, higher uh, car prices in general, just going up at tremendous, tremendous rates of growth. And now we're seeing the opposite in a very rapid fashion. The average price of a used Tesla is now down over $20,000 from its peak uh, last July. It's just stunning, stunning declines here week after week. And we've talked about what's driving this, so I won't talk about it again. Higher interest rates, Tesla cut the price of new cars, uh, lower demand, uh, combination of these factors leading to price declines. Uh, and this is good news for the US consumer, of course. And if we're looking at global freight rates, the trend has continued lower. Now we're at the lowest level since August, 2020, 
82% lower than 2021 levels. Not quite at pre-pandemic levels yet, but we're getting there. And so this is really further evidence that the supply chain issues are easing. This is going to have a positive impact on future prices. So very good news. And my favorite, of course, is the fertilizer price uh, index here. And that just continues to go lower. Uh, just huge, huge decline uh, from its peak in uh, March 2022. Now we're at the lowest level since February 2021. So the one thing in that inflation report, and hopefully the next one that we see this week, we're going to see some evidence of this. The one thing that hasn't started to move lower in a meaningful way has been the prices of food. And so fertilizer prices tend to be highly correlated with food prices. So hopefully this decline is going to start to impact uh, the price of food. And we're going to see a much lower rate of inflation there uh, in the next few months. And lastly, talk about natural gas. And thankfully, it was a much warmer winter than pretty much anyone predicted. Uh, that has caused the price of natural gas to plummet 77% decline. If you're looking at your energy bills, you're going to notice a big difference uh, in the next few months, natural gas uh, versus what you were paying. A huge difference just a, a, in a few uh, short months this is a positive factor for everybody in the world. Low energy prices are huge in terms of increasing people's prosperity. So uh, having cheap access to cheap energy, one of the main reasons why uh, people's standard of living has increased over time. Uh, because inflation adjusted energy prices are much lower than they were 20 years ago. That's a great thing for everyone. So hopefully the price of natural gas remains low. We don't see another spike higher. And so across the board, the ex exception of orange juice, we're seeing uh, much better things in terms of inflation. So I suspect when we get that uh, inflation number, we're going to see a, yet another decline on a year over year basis. Uh, so very good news. We'll see what the market's reaction to that. And we'll talk about that in next week's video. So let's end it right there. Have a great week, everyone. Thanks for joining. If you like the content, subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time.